Good morning, everyone. My name is John Muncha. I am Talos's social media manager and uh, kind of communications jack of all trades. Uh, I'm here today with Brad Garnett, the general manager of, of Cisco Talos Incident Response to talk about the basics of incident response as part of uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. How are you doing this morning, Brad? I am doing well, John. How about yourself? Pretty good. Uh, apologize for the stuttering this morning. I still need my my coffee. It's pretty early for us, even on the East Coast. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, I've, I've had my two cups of coffee, and I'm just coming back fresh from PTO, so quickly getting right back in the swing of things, all things security. Good I'm coming uh, fresh off the Browns uh, crushing loss to the Cardinals yesterday, so I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> <laughs> My so, Colts won, so it's a good Monday. <laughs> oh, there you go. So uh, the reason I wanted to have you on for a live stream this month specifically uh, is because I want the broader security world to, to learn about incident response and its importance as part of a layer security model, which is something we are always preaching at, at Talos. Uh, so for someone who has literally never heard of you before, say a company CEO who isn't necessarily security savvy, uh, or anyone who could be reaching us because it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month and we're just trying to make people more aware, obviously, of security, what is your elevator pitch for incident response and why it's important? Absolutely. Great question, John. So I think really it boils down to resiliency at the end of the day, right? Incidents are going to occur. How quickly an organization can recover the business impact uh, is all is what it's gonna boil down to at the end of the day, right? Having a tested incident response plan, understanding what your capabilities are, and then learning from the incidents that are impacting the organization from a recovery standpoint. So that's, I mean, those, you know, really four things, prepare, detect, respond, recover. That's really what it boils down to, um, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, incidents are going to occur. The impact is really how quickly we can respond and recover from that incident. So um, yeah, resiliency is what it's about at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So to start things off, I wanna talk about some of the specific things we've seen this year. Uh, obviously ransomware is making headlines all across the globe uh, and it's become a talking point for pretty much everyone, not just the security community. I mean, I even have uh, relatives who don't know much to anything about security who have been asking me about if they should be worried about ransomware or if their doctor's appointments are going to get canceled because their uh, you know, local hospital might get hit or something like that. Uh, so what can you tell us about the threat landscape in 2021? How has it shifted, uh, especially as it relates to ransomware? Well, we're to start, like we could probably spend the next 90 minutes right. John, talking <laughs> about ransomware. Um, you know, it is National you know, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So I think one of the key things for us to do as security professionals is have those conversations with family, friends, our partners, colleagues, right, about ransomware. Um, you know, when I think about 2021 and really the last year, I mean, ransomware finally, um, especially here in the, the US, right, has become a dinner table type conversation. You know, we learned from uh, JBS, right, you know, the grocery store colonial pipeline seeing that uh, that pain at the pump uh on the uh on the on the east coast so um it's definitely you know it's became a it's become a, a a dinner table type conversation so one of the things you know again having those conversations but really from a a trend standpoint is that extortion piece right um i guess from a you know from a executive summary standpoint the good there's good news um, at least the U.S. and recently, again, coming back fresh from PTO, getting caught up on all the things going on policy-wise. I know the White House ho hosted a, a global um, policy event, right, to talk specifically around ransomware, which is great. Ransomware is a national security priority. So, so to see governments around the world treating it as such is huge. One of the things um, that we did as far as, you know, Cisco, Talos, um, my partner in crime at Olney, who leads the threat intelligence team, um, we were part of the ransomware task force this past year, which was pretty cool to see, you know, the private sector governments and really, you know, folks around the world really come together to come up with a framework and recommendations to make an impact on ransomware. Um, one of the things that we identified and we recommended from that task force was coming up with a framework 
but also increasing support for victims of ransomware attacks. So it doesn't matter if you're a small, medium-sized business, right? A, a mom and pop store that's trying to maneuver a pandemic. Do you keep your doors open? Do you close your doors, right? Or are are you moving entirely to hybrid or you know whatever it may be? Um, but coming up with a framework are things that the government can do to protect their citizens around the world, but then also what private sector, right? Things that we can do uh, in this space as well. And that's one of the things I love about security and around incident response is really that that camaraderie, that that mission focus that, hey, you know, we're all smart. We're all part of this smaller yet larger global community and we can uh, make an impact. So really seeing, you know, from a policy perspective, um, a, tr a, a shift in ransomware. Now, you know, one of the things being a global incident response team is we do get to see a lot of intrusions impact, impacting different sectors. I mean, John, you talked about healthcare. Healthcare has been through a lot, uh, 2020 and then obviously 2021. I can tell you around 85% of the uh, incidents that we are supporting involve ransomware. So you throw in a pandemic, throw in ransomware, um, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's impacting, right? I will say this, one of the things that I've noticed, and you know, I think we're going to talk about by, by our good friends at Vice Society, the, the actor here, in just a few minutes. But one of the things that I've noticed in regards to ransomware and specifically healthcare is really around resiliency. I mean, I think healthcare does a really good job in preparing. So it doesn't matter if it's cyber or um, maybe a mass casualty event where they have to, you know, a, an influx in, in patients. Hospitals tend to do a really good job in preparing for those different scenarios. So uh, I had the privilege recently of doing an after action review. Again, talk, mentioning what I talked about earlier around from a recovery standpoint, having a conversation with the CISO from a, hos a hospital, one of the customers that we supported and, you know, finding out how we were able to come together, you know, their organization, our organization, then a third party to really help that, help them in their time of need, but also to kind of, you know, so they can minimize that direct impact uh, to healthcare. So, um, yeah, I mean, double, double extortion, you know, adversaries continue to raise the bar, but I think finally from a, seeing the, uh, tide shift standpoint, a lot of what's going on around the world globally here in the U S from a policy standpoint, you know, basically making the, the adversaries kind of up their game, whether it's going after, you know, the cryptocurrency, um, you know, going after following the dollars or from an infrastructure standpoint, what the adversaries are using to carry out these attacks. So, um, I've never been more optimistic, um, you know, in, in the fight against ransomware, but we still got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. So something that I, I've talked about with you and other CTIR folks, uh, for example, I had Pierre from your team on Cowell's Takes uh, several episodes ago about the importance of logging. And so this is a good uh, cybersecurity awareness month topic because this is a, an excellent security basics that people should have down. And so as we've written and talked about ransomware this year, logging is something that's coming up time and time again. If you don't have logs, it makes it so much harder for us, in this case being CTIR, <laughs> to learn about the specific incident. So what can you tell us about logs? You know, what are they exactly for someone who, again, like the first question I, I posed to you, for someone who may have the basic level of security knowledge, if not even that, and why are they so crucial to the work that your team does? Logs are probably more important now than they've ever been. And the reason I say that, why, is we see adversaries doing basic anti-forensics, right? Covering their tracks before they deploy ransomware uh, within, the, uh, within the environment. So really, you know, when you think about, you know, logging, uh, I mean, there's so many different things, you know, really what it boils down to, what are my control points within my organization at the network, at the endpoint, right? What, I'm, what am I leveraging in the cloud um, and those solutions? And what can I do to not only make sure that I'm collecting the, those logs, but also aggregating and enriching those logs? Because, you know, as I said out of the gate, incidents are going to occur. And some of the oftentimes from a DFIR, digital forensic and incident response standpoint, you know, logs matter. And being able to find out exactly what the adversary was able to do, uh, what they were not able to do or basically have access to is important. One of the things that we do 
um, when we're supporting a customer that's that's had a incident. One, find out what their capabilities are. Two, what type of regulatory or compliance issues may be at stake here. So, if it's healthcare in it, in particular, and it's somewhere in the in the U.S., right? Thinking about OCR or HIPAA some type of compliance, um, some type of notification that the organization may have to do. I mean, that's that's really what's uh, important at the end of, end of the day, right? Because those questions come up all the time. What do the adversary have access to? How long were they in environment? Did they exfiltrate data? Well, if they did, what was it regulated data? Because again, the, you know, the reporting and compliance requirements are going to change. So from a logging standpoint, you know, being able to have six months or nine months or longer worth of logs, um, whether it's your network devices, endpoint, again, from a infrastructure standpoint, all the things that are important because the adversary is gonna leave a digital breadcrumb behind um, whatever they had access to, the, the specific actions that they were uh, conducting. So yeah, logging is critical. I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things from a incident response standpoint is, you know, when you're following what the adversary had access to, um, you know, how long they've been in the environment, how they were mapping out systems and moving laterally is when you know that a specific artifact exists and it's not there um, just because a, a simple ACL or a policy that could have been put in place to make sure that that was logged. Um, you know, that's that does kind of change, um, you know, really the impact and then what you'll be able to ab and, you know answer at the end of the day. Right. Did the adversary have access to privileged data, was it exfiltrated? How long were they in the environment? Because that does change the, the risk landscape for the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick too, I, I just wanna make a plug for folks who are watching this live that uh, we'll be taking questions. Yeah, I have some uh, set questions obviously that I wanna ask Brad and learn more about. But uh, if you guys have anything that you want him to answer, whether it be about the current threat landscape, the incident response process, pretty much anything, uh, drop them in whichever chat you're watching on and and myself and my teammates are monitoring that to get your questions. So feel free to send anything in there if you want us to talk about it. Uh, but the next thing I, I want to ask you, Brad, is about the new offerings that CTIR uh, is adding. And th mm -hmm. I think this is something that's really cool. I just was able to be a part of the process of producing one of the recent reports uh, for the Talos Red Team, where they did a uh, physical pen test, basically. Uh, <laughs> I think that this team is just so freaking cool, and I'm so excited to uh, do some additional work with them. So specifically, we have the new Talos Red Team and the Network Security Architecture Assessment. What can you tell us about these processes, how they work, and uh, what an organization can learn about itself by participating in some of these projects? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as I like to say, red and blue go much better together. So, so glad to have our, our red team part of the organization now. I mean, that's awesome. So, yeah, the there are a lot of different, uh, well, let's just say offensive type of offerings that we do offer now through our Talos red team. But, um, you know, one of the foundational services that we do have, you know, and I guess this kind of does tell nice into your uh, question regarding logging, right? It's about, again, preparing for an incident. So, they're not the network security architecture uh, assessment is just one of the many proactive services that we do offer, again, to have our customers think about, you know, from a network infrastructure perspective, identify gaps in their current controls um, so they can, you know, review, you know, configuration management, do system hardening. And uh, again, you know, what our red team is going to do is, you know, have conversations uh, with the stakeholders in the organization, find out exactly, okay, what's your policy, what's your what's your process, um, and then we're gonna provide a recommendations, you know, on our specific findings. Uh, and again, it's all about logging at the end of the day and network security. So that is one of our popular services that we do offer to Talos Incident Response Retainer customers, but then also to our other uh, offensive uh, security, right? You know, pen testing, red teaming, uh, which is very, very popular. Then also purple teaming, right? Where we get into some of that the detection assessments and adversary simulation. And again, that's uh, that's really what it's about, you know, at, at the end of the day. I mean, those two services are becoming very popular, um, you know, with our with our customers. And then I think, well, let's just also give the blog, blog a plug, John, while we're at it. I know you and I and the uh -huh. team, we have something kind of here in the hopper that we're going to be publishing a case study in the near future 
regarding a recent red, um, a red team engagement. And then also customer had an incident. We got involved in really kind of telling that full life cycle from, you know, the, uh, from a, a, a red team engagement before the incident and then a uh, and then an incident that the customer experienced. So I'm looking forward to that uh, blog post being published. Yeah, to your point, uh, that that post that's going to be going out here in about a week or two uh, basically details some of the findings that CTIR was able to find in a uh, customer's website, the API that they were using, and uh, basically the the bad things that could have happened had we not been able to discover this. Uh, ahead of time. So as Brad said, it's kind of an excellent example of why being proactive instead of reactive is is so important for organizations. So uh, moving away from what, like you said, we could kind of talk about ransomware for 90 minutes if we wanted to. Uh, so kind of moving away from that as a topic of an, uh, the threats that are out there, what are some other trends you've seen on the threat landscape this year, you know, speaking of calendar year 2021 that particularly stand out to you? I think one of the big things is uh, business email compromise, right? And supply chain um, attacks. And I know our uh, trends are gonna be publishing here in a couple of weeks, but I mean, when you think about it and even going back to ransomware, I mean, whether it's Cobalt Strike or other remote access tools that adversaries are are leveraging, right? I mean, we see TeamViewer, AnyDesk, some of the other remote access tools um, that adversaries are leveraging, even pre-ransomware. Again, oftentimes, you know, there's usually a high probability that the end game is ransomware, um, but we still, you know, we still see adversaries leveraging those. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think business email compromise is one of the big things. Um, you know, and again, that's you know, depending on control such as multi-factor authentication, um, you know, and actually a properly configured MFA. Uh, solution. I mean, that's that's what's critical. So yeah, business email compromise uh, jumps out. It, you know, I mean, those aren't those don't, aren't going anywhere. Um, oftentimes, it's a you know there is a lack of sophistica- a sophistication by the adversary. However, when you think about email, I mean, still, I mean, it's what organizations use to create business records for the last twenty years. Um, and it, again, you know, email is a target rich environment. And one thing I like about being Talos and, and Cisco, right, is just being able to, again, when we're thinking about the attack lifecycle, what do the adversary has access, have access to historical telemetry that led up to the incident? I mean, email is so key. It's, you know, it's very critical um, from a, a visibility uh, standpoint. So, yeah, business email compromise, John, <laughs> um, you know, con- continues to jump out. I know we have a, a entire blog post out on the blog doing a deep dive on on business email compromise, but that that would be the big one. Aside from, of course, supply chain, right? Um, supply chain vector. Mm-hmm. So, for somebody who might be watching, uh, if they're not familiar with business email compromise, because as I've said several times, we're hoping to reach a wider audience than usual with with this. What kind of comes along with a BEC attack, and and what's kind of involved uh, from an attacker perspective there? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you think about it, you know, what are the ad- I'm going to go kill chain here for a minute. When you think about the action on objectives, <laughs> is it ransomware? Is it um, reconnaissance? Is it espionage? Whatever the adversary is doing, or am I just going to leverage your environment to to carry out you know further email type compromise, right? Do spoofing. So yeah, I mean when we see those again, I mean you know, you know email BECs really have evolved, um, you know. But when when you think about some of the common denominators, right? Um, something involving a you know a sense of urgency right like i need you to do this task immediately a quick favor or hi right there's that personal component to it um you know and we still we still see those you know those 419 scams nigerian scams you know pop up time and time again but there is a it's that sense of urgency trying to get the user not to click on something but hey i i need you to to do this, you know, wire this money to this account right away, right? Or you'll be fired, whatever, whatever it may be. So there's that fear that they're trying to, uh, you know, entice the user to take uh, some type of action. But again, you know, those are some of the things that we see, you know, time and time again, right? Whether, you know, obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, we we did see, and I think we've reported on that pretty heavily an uptick in, uh, you know, phishing and 
and business email compromise as well. But yeah, there are definitely common things that you know folks can do. Uh, you know, multi-factor authentication. You know, if it sounds too, too good to be true, it probably is. Pick up the uh -huh. phone. Hey, did you just send this email? Uh, again, right? With hybrid work, remote work here to stay. Um, you know, reach it. Just picking up the phone to to call someone. You know, uh, if that's a possibility. You know, that's that's a great way to defeat. You know, those. Uh, you know, the business email compromise, right? Again, trying to get the users to entice a user to perform some type of action. Mm -hmm. And on that topic, I will also do a uh, shelfish, uh, selfish uh, self-plug of Talos Takes, which you can find on our website and in your favorite podcatcher. Uh, I've seen a couple of people in the comments already shout out Talos Takes, so I love to see it uh, because that is, awesome. my, that is my baby. Uh, and I just released <laughs> an episode on Friday with, Jason Schultz from our research team discussing uh, spam and phishing campaigns that he's seen this year. So if you're interested in learning more about the threats that email presents, uh, I would encourage everyone to go and give a listen to that as well. 100%. Awesome. So the last thing I want to ask you about, Brad, and then we'll get to uh, some audience questions here, is about the hybrid work environment, because that's obviously what everyone wants to talk about. As everyone who's watching this can see, we are both working from home uh, and um, yeah. would imagine we'll be doing so for an extended period of time here. Uh, and as Cisco is doing, we're switching to a hybrid working environment permanently. Some may never go back to the office ever. Uh, you know, there's a lot still to be figured out there. So what are some security considerations defenders and CEOs should be thinking about when it comes to making decisions about the future of their workforce? Yeah, I mean, these are some of the conversations, right, that we've, you know, I, I know a lot of leaders have been having, you know, internally within Cisco, things that we've had, you know, within our organization on the team, right, how we work, um, it, you know, in the new hybrid, in the new hybrid world. So, you know, I think, you know, from a, you know, what should organizations and leaders be thinking about, you know, I think, you know, empathy and resiliency, again, we, you know, we talked about that in regards to ransomware, but really thinking about, um, you know, when I think, current state and then, you know, say six months or, or a year. Because again, hybrid work, most organizations around the world are really figuring this thing out. But I think about, you know, those you know, those honest, constant communications with, with teams within, you know, within organizations is what's critical because your workers and your workforce are going to tell you what their needs are. And then how, how, how leaders respond to that, you know, is, is going to be, it's going to be critical. But, you know, when you think about, you know, the traditional on-prem, right? work from anywhere. I mean, like you said, John, Cisco, you know, talked about, you know, the hybrid workforce is here to stay, you know, and really, you know, allowing our folks to enable them so they can work really from anywhere, whether it's, you know, at the home, whether it's in the office, a coffee shop, right? Somewhere else remotely, um, you know, all those things are critical. So thinking about, again, when we think about from a security standpoint, um, you know, obviously the, the edge or the moat is likely gone. But start thinking about, you know, um, you know, zero trust, you know, uh, and least privilege, right? So if this user is accessing the uh, accessing, you know, a specific application, their their device meets these requirements. Their you know the endpoint passes these specific tests, right? All those things are are really critical. I mean, you know, most users are going to be accessing cloud applications versus traditional on prem. Um, we've seen adversaries obviously target, um, you know, you know, uh, VPN. So those things are uh, critical as well. I'll, I'll just tell you this from a intrusion standpoint, you know, one of the things that we see early on in the pandemic is again, you know, you, you've heard this, um, you know, we, and that's one of the things that we security professionals talk about at nauseum is understanding normal so you can spot that anomaly. Well, when, you know, March of 2020 with the pandemic, you know, VPN telemetry and everything like that, you know, that, that normal, that baseline change. So, you know, just thinking about from a hybrid work perspective, how are workers and employees getting things done? What systems do they need access to applications? And what are we doing from an identity and access, um, email, applications, things like that? Really focusing on those three, I think, is what's going to be critical for organizations as they're figuring out, you know, how, how do they kind of work uh, going forward, um, you know, over the next 12 months, over the next few years from a hybrid workforce perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I am going to get into some questions here that we have from the audience. Uh, again, I will say if you're watching us, whether it be LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, uh, feel free to drop 
some questions in the comments. I'm, I'm taking a look here. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you about, Brad, because I've seen a few people uh, ask about this, is uh, in terms of joining the Talos incident response team and what it takes to, to work with an incident response team anywhere. Uh, this is something that I think Talos does incredibly well when it comes to building out our team is that we take folks from all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, we have rocket scientists, biologists, folks who were in the military. I know, Brad, I, I believe you were also in the military uh, previously. Um, I So basically, you know, if, if someone was looking to join Incident Response and someone can go to talusintelligence.com slash careers to look at the current openings we have uh, or to get a career in Incident Response, uh, what would you kind of recommend to them and what would you kind of say are the skills that you're looking for when building out your team? Yeah, great question, John. I mean, to your point, you know, having a uh, diverse team, the different skill sets that are required, right? I mean, um, I think one of the most important traits, one of the things that we look for is curiosity. Um, IR is, is, is tough work, right? When you think about it, you know, we talked about ransomware. Majority of the types of incidents that are impacting organizations are ransomware, throwing a pandemic. Um, and, you know, it's just, uh, it, it can be very stressful. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that we've talked about as a team, you know, globally is making sure our folks are taking care of themselves. You have to be able to be 100% every day if you're going to be able to bring your best to your work and to be able to support the customer. So, you know, skill set wise, right? If someone's just looking to break into incident response, right? I mean, there's all, I mean, we've got, uh, free report, free resources out on telusintelligence.com, but capture the flag opportunities, networking opportunities, right? Those things are critical. If you see a blog post, right? Something, maybe it's research that we're sharing, you know, tear, tear that apart. See if you can replicate those specific, um, you know, the indicators, the methodologies, all those things are critical. So yeah, I mean, when looking for people, whether it's uh, undergrad, wanting to get new, new to the role, right? Folks with diverse, education right psychology you know you talk about biology right and again you know when you start looking at common skill uh common denominators that curiosity is one of the things that you know that we look for soft skills as well right i would really challenge folks um you know if you were if you're in point your network forensics are uh you know you've got pretty strong skills there. looking at look at other opportunities um i'll just you know kind of uh Give a shout out to, or just kind of share with folks kind of like myself here right one of the things that i looked at you know um when i was transitioning out of government life into the private sector is um going out and actually speaking i did a ted talk <laughs> i thought what a better way to kind of you know have to really build those uh, soft skills you know i got assigned two different coaches one was a teacher one was a doctor you know and, and being coached by them to prepare really for that you know those 18 minutes of fame and on the stage um, so, yeah, the soft skills are also important. So that's why I said if you find something, a blog post, tear it apart, but then also being able to to do a report or, or tell tell a story um, to be able to tell that story, because that's what the, the data is at the end of the day. So, yeah, the curiosity, um, you know, the soft skills, you know, and again, that, that that's what I love about, uh, you know, really our entire organization, John, is just that, like you said, the, the people that come from all different walks of life, because we all look at data differently and that's so important from a threat intelligence standpoint whether it's research whether it's incident response because we all bring collective experiences for a simple mission and that's to protect our customers and respond to respond to incidents right so all right so another question here goes back to our uh conversation that we had about logs uh someone from youtube asked what are the most important logs during incident response uh you know is it anything like proxy endpoint anything like that yeah <laughs> you know it's funny you could ask probably a half a dozen different responders and everyone will have like how i would rank like my top three right um you know and again i think that often comes from okay like if my skill set my strong point is endpoint telemetry um okay maybe i'm going to ask for endpoint logs first if i'm a network forensic you know if i have you know, Kung Fu skills, you know, I can grip, I can tear apart logs. Maybe I'm asking for network logs first. So um, proxy logs are, are important. 
I'm going to say DNS and NetFlow, right? I mean, you know, endpoint EDR, those types of uh, tools. If your organization, you know, has an EDR solution, fantastic. Um, but also DNS and NetFlow, right? I mean, you know, when I think about, you know, malware has to run. Um, so, you know, D DNS is very critical. And then also NetFlow, right? I mean, we've seen adversaries remove endpoint solutions before deploying ransomware. Why? Because they've got domain admin and they can do whatever they want to within the environment. Um, so again, you know, seeing, you know, access to, to NetFlow, the east and west traffic when the adversary is moving laterally, you know, those are important as well. So yeah, endpoint, you know, for me, again, my bias, uh, you know, my background being traditional, um, you know, uh, digital forensics, uh, host forensics, yeah, endpoint logs, um, event logs are critical. Then also too, right? I think about you know malware um, and some of the different things that adversaries you know can do. Seeing processes that are being loaded uh, on the machine. Sysmon is a great tool, uh, free tool by Microsoft. So if you're a network defender that's wearing many hats, you know deploy uh, Sysmon so you can do that. And then also it looks like recently that um, I know Microsoft extended support for Sysmon and Linux. So which is which is important. So yeah, endpoint logs, but then also like I said, DNS and NetFlow. John, or I think are really important as well. All right, excellent. Uh, another question here from my Cisco Secure colleague, Hazel Burton, uh, who does an excellent job with her live streams. Uh, she yeah. asked, how often would you recommend testing an incident response plan? Uh, and this is something that is, you know, great for Cal's incident response customers, because not only do we offer the ability to create a, an incident response plan for you from essentially the ground up, but we also have things like tabletop exercises to work through those plans to regularly test them. So how often would you recommend a, an org update their IR plan and test against it? Yeah, great question, right? And that, that comes up all the time. Um, I mean, I know of some organizations that do quarterly tabletop exercises. Hey, that's great, right? If you, if you can do that and you have an internal IR team and capability and you can carve out time to do those tabletop exercises, great. Um, but, you know, depending on the size of your organization, I would say you know, you want to do those biannual or no later than once a year. And again, I'll, there's, you know, as in security, right, we always say it depends. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we think of hybrid work, the transition to remote, understanding cap your organization's capabilities, um, and then also how, you know, if I'm just recovering from a, enterprise-wide ransomware attack, testing, you know, doing a fresh after action review. And that's one of the things that we still do as an incident response team. And we're in the trenches every single day, right? Just doing after action reviews. What what worked, what did not work, what, what, what can we do better next time, right? So that, you know, I talked about recover earlier. So um, incident response or testing that incident response plan through a tabletop exercise. I would say biannual, I know, like I said, I know organizations um, that do it on a quarterly basis, and that is fantastic. But, but again, if you're if you just experience an incident, you're updating your incident response plan based upon what you're learning about your capabilities, and then you're testing that incident response plan through a tabletop exercise. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I there we have some. Uh, let's you know we've been talking about healthcare. Uh, I think my team's actually uh, supporting a healthcare customer this week with a a executive uh, tabletop exercise, um, and that's schedule on an annual basis. Again, it's going to depend on your audience. I mean, if you have a SOC and IR capability, um, you know, you should be doing those, you know, quarterly. Um, so, yeah, mileage will vary, but make sure you're doing them is the uh -huh. key message. And uh, kind of along that topic, I have another question here from LinkedIn. Uh, do you have any particular framework you would recommend to adopt as far as incident response goes? Uh, and again, I would definitely plug the uh, Talos Incident Response website, which I'll be dropping into the, the chats here so everyone can uh, read everything we have out there already. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, overviews that we have on the Incident Response website that kind of answer this and some case studies as well. Uh, but I'd be curious to hear your answer too, Brad. Like, what's a good starting point for an incident response plan? Or is there a certain framework that you all follow? Yeah, I mean, NIST and SANS are great free, um, you know, uh, frameworks that are that are out there. Um, so yeah, we use a uh, the one that we use internally and for our, customer, our IR retainer customers is a 
is a slight modification of the SANS and NIST, but those are great frameworks um, that are out there. And I would encourage, you know, you know, organizations or the listeners here to, to definitely check those out. I will say, um, too, one thing, you know, we were, the, the question that Hazel provided or asked regarding tabletop um, exercises. I know uh, NIST and I think FEMA, I mean, if, if, if you're a, you know, if you're a, a, a jack of all trades, a jack or jill of all trades, and you wear all the hats within your organization, FEMA actually has free tabletop resources out there as well that you can download the slide deck to the different injects to be able to do that. Uh, and I know we've, we've shared some things out, out on our blog and cisco.com regarding tabletop exercises um, as well. Uh -huh. So yeah, NIST and SANS are great, are great frameworks for incident response. Uh -huh. All right, so we've got time for, uh, let's see, like a couple more questions here. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so from YouTube here, uh, we have a question. Can you talk about the importance of user awareness and training? And are there examples of some simple things that people and organizations can do to protect themselves? Um, again, I'll plug Talos takes because this is something that Jason and I discussed on last week's episode about spam and phishing about the importance of user awareness, because especially with things like business email compromise, like we discussed earlier, uh, that just comes down to the users being aware of what a common scam looks like and how to kind of sniff that stuff out before they start clicking around on any links or anything like that. Uh, but do you have any other uh, user awareness tips? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, a couple things. I mean, again, one, it's, you know, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So your security professional having just conversations with uh, folks is probably the most important thing. Um, you know, when we talk, we're talking about trends over the last year. I mean, you know, we continue to see trends um, and then make recommendations around user awareness, right? So email, you know, business email comp compromise, right? Folks clicking on our end users clicking on uh, clicking on links. But I also think to at least in the security community, there's been such a emphasis put on, um, you know, the, the user awareness training that sometimes we forget some of the other things, right? Like, again, we've seen adversaries taking advantage of CVEs that have been around, you know, 2019, 2020, right? So that, you know, being able to, that time to detect patch, um, you know, patching is, is so important, right? Because again, we still, we still see adversaries taking advantage of old CVEs. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's many different solutions out there. Uh, one of the things that we do from an advisory standpoint, right, if we're doing a tabletop exercise, let's say, right, if we're maybe the help desk, the SOC is within scope, maybe we will, you know, try to uh, call into that help desk or the SOC to see if we can, you know, get domain admin or, or you know, test that aspect. So if you're doing a, if your organization is doing some type of internal uh, you know, tabletop exercise, you know, using, um, you know, the, that component to test is also important. We've done tabletop exercises and other advisory engagements where, you know, we, uh, the user was aware that we were doing this um, engagement and we simply changed their desktop. So it looks like a ransomware impacted the machine. So when, you know, help desk or IT look at it, they think there's a, a ransomware attack. Going on, so there are different things, you know, from a, a user awareness standpoint that can be done. And again, I think, you know, organizations, uh, you know, email continues to be a vector, and, and doing those uh, are important. So I, I think, you know, the conversations, um, again, understanding what incidents are impacting our organization. Um, you know, if if you do a lot of routine uh, training for your end users, maybe phishing is not a problem in your organization. Maybe there are other things that you need to do, but really understanding. Um, where can I focus, you know, 20% of the effort with my resources available to make that 80% impact is what's important. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have one final question for you, Brad, and then we'll, uh, we'll get you out of here. Um, but something that I, I kind of just want to know in general is coming from me. Uh, <laughs> if someone wants to engage CTIR uh, and they're coming to you guys for, for the first time, what are some questions that they need to be prepared to answer when they come to your team? Uh, because, you know, some of the folks who may be watching have never had an IR retainer before or may be new to this uh, arena altogether. So what are some good things to have prepped before they come to engage CTIR? 
And of course, we're here for emergency services too. So, you know, if this is not to say that this is a barrier to work with you all, obviously. Right. Logs, logs, logs. No. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, the key thing, um, I think, is really what it boils down to is again, understanding your organization's capabilities. Um, oftentimes you know we see i mean it's it's great to see but then also like the individual heroics that we see during incident response right so you see a a specific customer a, a stakeholder at an organization that is doing all these different things but they you know they like you know they kind of get in over their head or they don't escalate things uh you know quickly enough so really understanding your organization's capabilities right what do i have from an instrumentation standpoint what am i doing from a logging standpoint um, and you know, that's what it really what it boils down to at the end of the day. Now for customers that are experiencing an incident, right? If they call us and again, talusintelligence.com, you know, slash IR, we're going to want to find out, you know, a couple things right away. One, what's the current impact to the organization, right? Or is, are we talking about, uh, downtime? What's the application? Um, uh, is it regulated data, right? All those different things. Um, so, you know, impact, what are the objectives? Do you have a reporting requirement? Do we need to work with legal? Um, is, is, have you put your cyber insurer on notice? So there are a lot of winding roads. Um, and again, I like to say, you know, incident response really is that ultimate team sport, right? You're bringing kind of the best and bringing everyone together for a simple mission um, to, you know, to for the for the to support the the nature at hand, right? Um, so yeah, capabilities uh, are are really critical. Understanding your capabilities, but then also know your your limitations as well mm -hmm. all right well i think that's going to do it for us brad uh i appreciate your time today and your insight for cyber security awareness month uh i really appreciate it i know your team is really busy but i hope a lot of people who watch this uh learned a lot and were able to uh, hopefully apply some of these practices to their organization uh again i really just want to make a plug for the ctir website where you can learn so much more about this organization and what our team does, uh, you can go to talusintelligence.com slash IR or uh, incident underscore response. Either of those will work and I've dropped the link in the, the chats here. Um, but you can find the emergency number there. If you are experiencing any sort of a security emergency and need to get in contact with someone, there's the phone number there. There's also overviews of all the various offerings that incident response has. Uh, that you can check out and read through. This is like a new website that we only launched a few months ago that we're we're really proud of. Uh, there's also the Stories from the Field series that I did uh, two years ago that I still think hold up really well today. And they are from some incident response team members kind of talking about real world incidents that they worked on and kind of what some of the lessons were that they took away from those. And hopefully that would be helpful to to anyone really to kind of get that boots on the ground intelligence that we like to talk about so much. All right, well, thank you so much again, Brad. I appreciate it and I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'm sure we'll uh, find something to talk to you about at some point down the road, but hopefully not, not too soon. <laughs> Nothing crazy. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, John. This has been wonderful.